mixture of uh, Massachusetts governor, Elbridge Jerry, and he was a politician. And it turns out that he drew a line uh, when he was doing the redistricting. Um, he drew, uh, this is a, a map of Massachusetts. And this red line, red part is one district he uh, curved up. Um, and you can see that um, this uh, uh, part of the district looks a little strange shape where there's a little bit uh, on the top, uh, you know, it's sort of surrounding this particular area. And some people thought this was intentional and trying to help uh, his own party. And so they created this cartoon that shows a uh, salamander. It's an uh, imaginary animal uh, from sort of European uh, tradition. And his name, Jerry and Salamander, became Jerry Mander. Okay, so it was, it's basically the partisan uh, or racial gerrymandering. So you can draw a boundary of electoral districts in such a way to benefit some parties or some racial groups. Okay, so that's basically what the gerrymandering called intentional redrawing of the electoral boundary, electoral district boundaries, such that it benefits a particular party or a particular racial group. So here is a, a map of um, actually voters in the United States. So we just had an election. Uh, still, uh, president has refused to accept the results. But so here we see um, the map of uh, US voters. And so I, I wrote this title, Elections During the Big Data Era. So now the campaign, political campaigns, have access to these data sets. Okay? So, the blue dots are Democratic voters, and um, red dots are Republican voters. And you can see that population is quite concentrated in the New York area and California. And then they're in the middle, there's a, it's very sparsely populated. So now you can zoom in. So this is Florida, map of Florida. Again, the population is quite concentrated in the Miami area and uh, in the middle, there isn't, there isn't much people right there. You can further focus into the area of Miami. And then you can even go farther at the household level. So here you see the street. And each of these symbols are little household. Okay, Blue is Democrat. Red is Republican. Uh, gray is Independent. And... Um, the purple is mixed uh, household, mixed Democrats and Republicans. Now you might wonder, like, why do you have this all this information? Well, it turns out that in the United States, there's something called the registered voter list, uh, which I'm sure that Taiwan has one as well, but it's public information. So in the United States, you can have access to uh, registered voter list, list of the, all the registered voters whose name and address and sex and birthday and the, some in some states partnership, whether you are registered as a Democrat or Republican or independent. And the, uh, in southern states, also your racial um, group, okay, self-identify race. All this uh, information is actually publicly available. So political campaigns use the information and then um, put them on the map so that they know exactly where you live and what your name is and what your partnership might be. Okay, so this is how once you focus on to the uh, small level, that's what you see. And then um, if you zoom out, you get, you get this map. Okay, so what I wanted to tell you about these maps is that in the big day, big data era, the political campaigns know a lot about you and where you live, okay? And then when that happens, that they tend to draw electoral boundaries, they can draw boundaries in such a way that um, the, the particular district map will benefit uh, your own party, okay? 
Okay, so um, it also tells you whether you voted in the previous elections. Um, it doesn't obviously tell you which candidate you voted for, but, but whether you voted or not is also public information. Okay, And so the political parties can use all this information to draw a line in such a way that to benefit, benefit your own party. Okay. So today's gerrymandering, uh, how does that look like? Uh, so this is back from the 2003. And I picked the Texas. Um, that's where the professor Paul is. Um, so here they changed, uh, they did the redistricting in 2003. And in 2002, Republicans won the 16 seats okay, in the election, 2002 election. They won the 16 seats out of 32 seats. In 2004, only two years later, they won 21 seats. Okay? And people suspected that that was uh, due to the change in the districts. So you can see the districts have changed quite a bit, the shape of the districts. For example, this district became much bigger. And then here also, like this district became much um, longer shape. Okay? So this drawing the different lines uh, partially uh, contributed to this huge increase in the Republican um, uh, election victory. Okay? So in, in this case, the US Supreme Court ruled uh, this as a racial gerrymandering and uh, struck down this particular particular redistricting map. Okay. Um, so how do you gerrymander? Okay. Uh, there's like two basic strategies. First one is called packing. So here, uh, each dot represents a voter. Okay. And I made it so that red dots have, uh, red and blue dots have three to two ratio. Okay. And there's three uh, seats, so three districts. And what I did is something called packing, where I packed all the blue voters in one district so that in the remaining two districts, the red party is uh, more likely to win. Okay. Now I can redraw these lines even for more, and this is called cracking. Okay. So I cracked the blue voters into this, I split them into three districts, such that within each district, the red party has the majority. So in this case, the red party will win all three seats, even though uh, the ratio of, uh, they only have three fifths of the uh, voting population. Okay. So as you can see by drawing the lines in a different ways, you can come, even if the same um, voter, voting, you know, voter distribution, you can come up with a very different election outcomes. Okay? So drawing the lines really matter. Now, redistricting in America is a little bit different. Uh, I'm sure it's very different from Taiwan, but I'm curious what uh, how they how it's done in Taiwan. Uh, in in the U.S., the redistricting happens every, after every decennial census. So census happens every ten years, and after the census. The population is tarried, and then redistricting happens. Okay. And when we do the redistricting, we do both congressional, that's a federal level, and state uh, registrative districts. Rules vary across states because it's a federalism. So each state has very different rules. So the rules that are used in Texas are very different from rules used in California, for example. But there are some basic rules that's more or less shared across different states. The first rule is equal population. So each district has to have a roughly equal population, okay? often like very precise, so often very up to like one voter. They, they often divide into uh, precisely equal population based on census counts. And there's some Voting Rights Act of 1965, which tried to protect minority voters, the, the rights of minority voters. Okay. At the state level, there are some rules as well, like the, each district usually have to be contiguous, so it has to be connected. Um, it has to be compact, which means it 
cannot have a weird shape, although that could happen sometimes, um, but it has to be a compact shape. And it should preserve some administrative uh, boundaries or community boundaries, such as county or cities and towns. Those boundaries should be respected as much as you can. You shouldn't cut through the, the district should not cut through the many of these uh, different uh, communities. So these are the basic rules. So who decides how to how the uh, redistricting uh, districting boundaries should be drawn? Many in the majority of states, this is the crazy part. The state legislature decides. That is, the politicians draw the boundaries of their own electoral districts. Okay, not the voters. The politicians get to decide which voter is your constituency. So obviously when the politicians uh, do this, they tend to maximize their own gain. So they try to draw a district such that it benefits themselves and their own party. Okay. There are some other states, a uh, small number of states, six states, has an independent commission. So in these states, they don't let the politicians draw lines. Um, they have independent body, which often consists of some experts, like. Uh, uh, university professors. Um, <clears throat> and until the Supreme Court case, Shelby uh, County and Holder, this is, was done in 2013, southern states with a history of racial discrimination were required to obtain some kind of pre-clearance, like approval from the federal government. But this Supreme Court decision said you, you no longer have to do that. So now it's there's going to be a lot more, um, um, you know, party uh, party is going to have a battle over how uh, redistricting uh, how the district should be drawn. Okay. Um, so in the end, uh, in many states, lots of courts, the state and the federal courts, end up involving, um, getting involved in the redistricting. So in twelve states in two thousand ten. The courts decided, ended up deciding um, how to draw up. So, what I'm going to talk to you today um, is we can use the data and uh, statistical methods to detect gerrymandering. Okay? So, when the politicians uh, do this type of intentional um, drawing of the lines, redrawing of the district boundaries. How do we detect uh, whether that's actually happening? Okay. So first step is to uh, define statistical measure of gerrymandering. Okay. The one approach might be based on the wasted votes, the idea of wasted votes. So if there are a lot of um, districts where, say, Democrats um, in the districts where the Democrats lose, um, you know, they lost it. Uh, there's a lot of votes um, that were cast for Democrats, but didn't quite um, uh, lead to the Democratic victory. Um, then this might be the um, uh, evidence uh, of uh, gerrymandering, right? Because you can make it, you can draw a district line such that um, you pack the Democrats, but not quite enough to win the district, okay? So that you can force Democratic party or Republican party um, to waste their votes. Okay? So that's one idea. The another idea is based on something called the seat vote curve uh, and parts and symmetry. So here in this graph, on the x-axis, I have Democratic vote share. Okay? So this is the share of the Democratic vote uh, in the state. And on the y-axis, I have Democratic seat share which is the uh, share of the Democratic seats in the state, okay? If it's a winner take it all, then as soon as you uh, win the more than 50% of the votes, you win 100% of the seat, okay? So this would be like a presidential election. Like if you go above 50% of uh, two-party vote share, a presidential candidate can win all the electoral votes, okay? Proportional representation is the system where um, uh, the C share and both share is exactly the same, okay, or close to the same. So both of these systems are symmetric. It's symmetric around 
this point. So what that means is that although winner take it all is different from proportional representation, from the point of the partisan symmetry, it's it's exactly the same. It's fair. Like if the Democrats win 40% of the vote uh, in the winner take it all, they have 0% of seats. Similarly, if the Republican wins 40% of the votes, they also have 0% uh, of the seats, okay? So both systems are symmetric in terms of Democratic Democrats and Republicans, two-party symmetry. So it's a fair system, okay? You can come up with other systems where this red line is a bias towards Republican because Democrats would always get, um, even if they have 40, say, for, you know, 50% of the vote share, their C share is only, uh, say, 25%. Okay, so Democrats have always um, uh, the fewer C share than, the, than their vote share. On the other hand, the Republican has the opposite. Okay, so that's not a um, fair system according to this symmetry criteria. The blue line is the opposite. It's biased towards Democrat because Democrat has 30% of the vote and um, but still win the 50% of seat. Whereas if the Republican has 30% of the votes, then they only win um, you know, about 10%. Okay, so this that's this blue line would be biased towards Democrat. The green line here is unbiased. Because although if the Democrats win the 40% of the seat as uh, vote, uh, they only win the 20% of the share, the same thing happens to Republican. If the Republican win uh, the 40%, so 100 minus 60, 40%, they also win the 20% of the seat, 100 minus 80, okay? So in, even though this system is not proportional represent, uh, representation, it's symmetric, so you can think of it, it's fair. Okay, so there's a different um, way of measuring, gerrymandering, how a particular system is biased towards Democrats or Republicans. Okay. So one thing you can do is to look at, conduct something, uh, what's called the outlier analysis. Okay, so what we wanna say is that, okay, based on the, uh, a criteria that we have, say equal population, contiguity, compactness, and all these different criteria, okay? What we wanna know is whether the particular proposed um, map, proposed redistributive map is an outlier compared to the other uh, past, you know, potential maps that could have been drawn that satisfy the same criteria, okay? So in order to conduct the outlier analysis, I need to have a baseline distribution. I need to have a distribution of redistricting maps that would satisfy the same set of criteria and then compare that distribution with a particular map that was proposed, okay? And if that particular map that was proposed is very different from this distribution, baseline distribution, then I would, decide, I would conclude that it's an outlier, hence it was gerrymandered. What's challenging about this is that we have to account for state-specific geography and the voter distribution. So depending on the state, it will be a different shape, different number of um, districts, uh, different distribution of voters. So for example, in Massachusetts, the Republicans are spread out pretty evenly across uh, different parts of the state. Whereas um, in some other state, um, say Texas or Florida, the Democrats tend to be clustered in the city and um, fewer Democrats live outside of the, uh, out of, you know, in the rural area, for example. So we have to account for all these state-specific factors in order to come up with the baseline distribution. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Well, one possibility is like enumerate all possible redistricting plans. But it turns out that it's just impossible. Just there's so many of them. Okay, so you cannot enumerate all possible uh, patterns. For example, if you think about number of ways to divide, uh, divide up eight by eight checkerboard into two regions. Okay, so 
think about there are 16 um, areas, geographical areas, and then you want to divide it into two regions. It turns out there is 1.2 times 10 to the 11 ways to do that. Okay. And then each state is much, much bigger than eight by eight checkerboard. And there's more uh, districts often than two, two districts. So there's a huge number of ways to do this. Um, so we can't, we, it turns out we cannot um, enumerate all possible ways. Okay. So what we're gonna do is uh, sampling. So if we can't count them all, uh, what we can do is do sampling, okay? This is the same idea as uh, public opinion poll. We cannot interview every voter in the country, but we can randomly sample a uh, very small number, say 1,000 people from the population, and then use that to estimate the distribution of a public opinion. So in the same logic, we can sample the maps, redistributed maps that satisfy the required uh, conditions and then use that to characterize the distribution and then compare that with the proposed um, redistributing plan. Okay, so that's basically the idea. And I'm not gonna go into detail uh, of the particular algorithm. If you're sort of uh, into data science and wanna know the detail, you can look at the paper. But what's nice about this algorithm we developed is it accounts for equal population, contiguity and compactness. You can limit the number of splits of administrative units. I told you that we don't want to split the communities as much as uh, possible. Uh, we can also specify the target distribution of redistributing plans. So we can say, ah, oh, we want to make it more compact, then we can do that. Okay. And it's also, uh, most importantly, applicable to large states. So even if the state is large like Texas, we can apply this algorithm. So the example I'm going to uh, present you is Pennsylvania. In this state, we have 9,256 precincts. Precincts is a small geographical unit, the smallest geographical unit that reports election results. Okay, so we can analyze the election results. In this state has 67 counties, and then there's a total of 18 districts. Okay. Um, and what's nice about this sequential Monte Carlo algorithm is it, it's independent, it generates an independent sample unlike Markov chain Monte Carlo. So we sampled 15, um, 15 redistributing plans that satisfy these constraints uh, to approximate baseline distribution. Okay, so the idea, um, I'm not going to again talk too much about the actual algorithm, but basically it starts and then spreading. Um, one district at a time like this. Okay? So that's how, how the algorithm proceeds. It's like it start carving each district randomly uh, based on some, some criteria. Okay, so now we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you the results. Uh, so in this uh, state, turns out there was a controversy and different parties ended up uh, proposing uh, different plans. Okay, so here, I'm gonna look at six different plans and compare each of these plans uh, based on the, uh, against the distribu uh, distribution of the baseline plans that I sampled um, that satisfies the same set of constraints, okay? Um, so here I'm showing the fraction of edges removed. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this uh, represents how compact uh, the districts are, okay? So the more edges removed, uh, less compact it is. So you can see that distribution is in a gray histogram. So that's a sample distribution. So um, the type of, um, you know, the constraints that the state is proposing generates this type of uh, distribution. The yellow line is the general assembly plan, which was controlled by the Republican. So you can see that this plan is way out, you know, way beyond um, outside of the distribution, which represents the outlier. And in, in fact, the state uh, Supreme Court ruled that this, um, this plan is actually gerrymandered. Okay. So you can see General Assembly plan, which is controlled by the Republican plan, was quite an outlier. The other plan seems to be um, 
right in the distribution. And um, the pram that was adopted by the core eventually, the uh, purple pram, is actually more compact even um, than the most of the samples that we obtained. Okay. Now on the right, I show the number of counties spread. Again, I told you that we want to minimize the number of counties spread. So according to this measure, you can also see that this Republican plan, General Assembly plan, is an outlier, is a way out there compared to this distribution, the gray distribution that I have. The plan by the House Democrats, so this is the Republicans, this is Democrats, is also an outlier according to this county spread measure. Again, the final plan that was uh, chosen by the court um, is, is uh, inside of the distribution. So we don't see that, um, you know, too many, we don't see that too many counties are being spread. Okay. Uh, governor's plan and Respondent plan, petitioner's plan are also inside of that distribution. So this is a sort of idea of um, outlier analysis. So you generate lots of maps that satisfy the same set of uh, con uh, conditions and then compare it with the proposed plan and then see if the proposed plan is actually an, an outlier. Okay. Now let's look at the vote share, uh, distribution of vote share. So here, I'm gonna focus on two plans. The plan that was adopted by the court, uh, which is in the, uh, by the purple, and um, yellow um, plan is the General Assembly or orange plan. Uh, this is the Republican plan that was ruled as uh, gerrymandered. On the y-axis, we have democratic vote share. And the, on the x-axis, we have districts, um, uh, 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 sorted from the least to most democratic districts. There's 18 of them because there's 18 districts. Okay. And in each box plot, the gray box plot, is a distribution according to the R sample, our random sample of the plans that satisfy the same set of complaint, uh, uh, same set of conditions. And you see that the dots are the particular plan that we observe. Now, what you see is that most of the courts, uh, the plan by the courts, are inside of the distribution, especially around the 50% uh, line. Mostly, more or less, it's inside of the distribution, whereas the orange plan tend to be a little bit away from it. In particular, you see that um, around um, the districts that are very close, uh, very competitive districts. So if you look at this district, for example, the distribution is around 50%. So Democrats are getting 50% for this district. But the plan by the Republican makes uh, make it so that Democrats only have 40%, 45%. So it's much lower. So these uh, districts, the Democrats are going to have a hard time winning the, um, winning the seat because their plan, uh, the General Assembly plan, the Republican plan, make it so that Democratic voters aren't, there aren't enough Democratic voters to make it about 50%, okay? On the other hand, these districts where there are lots of Democrats, uh, Democratic voters exist, you see that the Republican plan put lots of Democrats, um, more Democrats than necessary in some sense, um, in the packing in those districts. Okay, oops, sorry. Um, now, uh, here's the um, sort of summary statistics, which people call gerrymandering index. So the larger this index is, um, the more gerrymandered uh, the districts are. And again, the gray uh, histogram is the R distribution. And you see that clearly that the General Assembly plan, the Republican plan, is, um, is outlier compared to this distribution, whereas the other uh, plans are uh, within this uh, distribution. In particular, the court plan is uh, in, in sort of close to the middle of the distribution. So we don't see there's any outlying uh, tendency there. Okay. And finally, um, this graph sort of takes this graph 
and then um, put together one to five uh, for least democratic to fifth um, least democratic. You put these together into one uh, one box plot, and then five, uh, six to ten, and eleven to fourteen, and fifteen and eighteen into one uh, box plot to make it a little bit easier to see. And what you see is that you know the districts that are least democratic. The Republican plan would put a lot more Democrats in there. So you pack the Democratic voters in the least Democratic um, districts where they cannot win. Okay, and in the middle places where the Democrats and Republicans are, you know, are very competitive districts, uh, they put fewer Democrats. Okay, so Democrats are packed in uh, either very Democratic or least democratic districts, and then fewer Democrats are, be, are put in the competitive districts. Uh, on the other hand, the plan by the court have um, tend to be actually a little bit more uh, Democrat favored, where you see that uh, in the competitive districts, they put more Democratic voters than the distribution. Than our distribution. So as a result, it turned out that um, after court adopted the new plan, Democrats won um, a few more seats uh, than um, previous uh, compared to the previous election. Okay. So as you can see, what the idea here is to generate these distributions, uh, compare uh, the proposed plan with this distribution, and determine whether it's outlier. And if it's an outlier, that constitutes evidence um, for the uh, for the gerrymandering. And this type of analysis has been used quite a bit in the court uh, to decide whether a particular plan is actually a, a gerrymandered plan. Okay. So just to conclude for this uh, first part of the talk, uh, political parties use data extensively. Uh, they use it to micro-target for voter mobilization. The Democratic Party tries to mobilize the Democratic voters. Republican parties try to mobilize the Republican party, uh, voters. They also use to um, measure opinion, um, uh, pu public opinion of voters to figure out what messaging uh, is most effective. Um, and these voter and election data are used for redistricting. Mm -hmm. So what we what I showed you is to use you can use the data analysis to detect the gerrymandering. Um, so I showed you the outlier analysis by simulating the redistricting plans and then comparing that with the actual plan. And the algorithm is easy to use and widely applicable to many different settings. Uh, there's even a package. So if you want to uh, analyze uh, how the electoral districts are determined in any systems you could use this to uh, conduct the analysis. So maybe um, someone can try to analyze the legislative redistricting uh, in Taiwan as well, using this type of uh, technique. So this is sort of the end of the, my first part of the talk. Um, and I'll just pause here quickly, and if there's any questions, I can take one or two and then move on to the next part of the talk. Sure, Adam. Hi, Imai, this is quick. Uh, I want to know how the court has the information. Is is the court getting information that they can arbitrate or, or strike on a point? <clears throat> Looks like that the court decision is uh, uh, compared to other plans are still the best or more uh, uh, giving uh, uh, some kind of balancing uh, to the, the the uh, uh, gerrymandering, also uh, uh, the party taking advantage, uh, push to the right, uh, to the, yeah. How this uh, uh, information is available to the courts? Yeah, so the courts basically hear the arguments by the uh, plaintiff and uh, uh, defendant, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you know each party are uh, are involved, and each party mm -hmm. present the evidence. So in the Pennsylvania case, the Republicans basically first drew a line, uh, you know, drew a map, and then um, the legal women voters. So this is like, um, you know, one organization sued the Republican. 
saying this is uh, gerrymandering. So they went to the court and then they argued each other. And a lot of academics uh, uh, serve as expert witness and they present yeah. this mm -hmm. analysis. And then court hearing mm -hmm. this opinion, then they make a decision uh, as to whether, you know, uh, they are convinced by one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the court mm -hmm. doesn't do um, their own analysis necessarily, but they, mm -hmm. they look at the evidence that's been presented, the argument that's been made, and then they make the decision. So, so this type of analysis is very important um, because that's being used as a part of the, you know, argument um, by the plaintiff or by the um, defendant um, to make their own case. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, this is another way of using um, the data and the data analysis to evaluate mm -hmm. how fair particular Great. How about that? Please proceed with the uh, uh, now uh, the second part. Maybe we can have, we can collect more questions uh, okay. after you present the second second uh, project. Okay. All right. Okay. About that. Thank you. Yeah. Let me move on to the second project. So the second project is has to do with um, use of AI. So there's um, we we've seen that in our daily lives. The statistics and machine learning and artificial intelligence that's been used. Uh, this is actually nothing really new, but, but it has accelerated due to the technological advances. There's a lot of examples out there. Um, you know, nowadays, the, even the games, the humans are losing to the uh, machines. <laughs> uh, now the question is, but still, like, we make uh, many consequential decisions. Uh, we don't um, we don't, uh, we haven't like outsourced important decisions to the machines yet. So when we go to the doctor, uh, hospital, it's not the machine who is going to uh, figure out what's wrong, it's, it's a human doctor. When you go to the court, it's not the machine who is going to decide whether you're guilty or not. It's a human judge. So we still make, uh, we humans, we still make um, these important decisions. This is true even when human decisions are suboptimal, maybe biased or maybe not very efficient. Okay. Even if it, when we know that, we still often humans are the ones who make a decision. Maybe we want to hold somebody rather than something accountable for the consequence of the, the, these decisions that we make. Okay. So as a result, most popular system is something I, I call algorithm-assisted human decision-making. Okay. Humans make decisions, but with the help of algorithmic recommendations. So algorithm make a recommendations, human look at it and make a decision. It may follow the algorithmic recommendation or may not. Okay. So this you see this all the time, the routine decisions like online shopping, right? People uh, the machines, uh, the website will make a recommendations, but you are the one who make the decision what to buy. Right? We still haven't reached the point where we, you tell the machine, "Oh, I need a grocery. Can you figure out what what, what should be, you know, what you should, what what we should buy?" We don't do that. We still we get recommendations uh, from some algorithm, but we we are the one who still make a final decision as to what to buy. And this is also true in the consequential decisions. Uh, judges and doctors often receive some algorithmic recommendations, but they are the ones who make the decision. Uh, so in this setting, we can make some uh, questions and we can ask some questions and think about how to solve these issues. How do algorithmic recommendations influence human decisions? Do they help human decision makers achieve their goals? Do they help humans improve the fairness of their decisions? Many have studied the accuracy and the fairness of algorithms, how accurate the algorithms are, how fair the algorithms are, and often they found the algorithms more accurate than humans. But not many people have studied their impact, the impact of algorithms on human decisions. 
very little is known about how algorithmic bias interacts with human bias. So in this research, what we do, my, what, what, my, what my collaborators and I do, um, is to figure out how to conduct experiment and evaluate algorithmic, um, how the algorithmic recommendations affect human decision. And we sort of introduce a new fairness notion based on uh, uh, causal inference ideas called principal fairness. And then we conduct a real world field experiment evaluating uh, pre trial public safety assessment, which is used a lot in the uh, judicial decision making in the United States. Okay. So, first, I want to introduce you to a um, particular controversy. Um, uh, this was um, a big controversy in the United States uh, about something called Compass Score. Okay. It was published in the ProPublica. It's a um, organization of journalists. They found that uh, this compass score is used to rate the risk of people who get arrested. So here, there are two people who committed petty theft. Okay, so they committed very minor crime. The, uh, this person, um, white man, was classified by the algorithm as low risk. Whereas this lady, uh, African American lady, was classified by the algorithm as high risk. Okay. Similarly, uh, this journalist found that uh, there are two arrestees who committed the same crime, the drug possession. So they has they possess some drugs, but this uh, white man was uh, classified by the algorithm as low risk, whereas this African American man was uh, classified as high risk. Okay. And the um, paper, uh, this journal, uh, this newspaper article uh, argued that there is a racial bias. And they looked at the white defendant risk score is um, many people are rated as a, a low, uh, many people are rated as low risk, one, two, three, and not many people are listed as high risk. These are white, white, white defendants. Whereas black defendants, there are a lot more people who are rated as high risk. Okay, so you can see the distribution is quite different. And uh, maybe there is some racial bias of this algorithmic score. Um, okay. So what we're going to uh, do is evaluate one of such algorithms. Okay, so, uh, we're going to call pretrial public safety assessment, PSA. It's an algorithmic recommendation that's used in US criminal justice system. At so-called the first appearance hearing, so after you get arrested, you, you go to this first appearance hearing, judges make uh, primarily two decisions. First, they decide whether to release an arrestee pending disposition of criminal charges. So these people are not yet uh, charged of crimes. But the judge is trying to decide whether to release or not. Okay, and then if they decide to release, uh, what condition to impose a bail or a monitoring, for example. Okay? So the goal is to avoid the unnecessary predispositional incarceration because these people are not yet charged while preserving the public safety. So if someone is dangerous, you don't want to release that person to the street because they may commit a new crime. Um, but if someone is not, uh, it's very safe, then you should release it because that person hasn't been charged. So judges are considered to, uh, required to consider the following these factors, along with other things. Um, arrestee may fail to appear in court, FTA. So if you release somebody, they may not come back to the court. Um, they're supposed to come back to the court so that they can, um, where the judge decides the uh, make a decision as to whether the um, charges are actually uh, valid. RST may engage in new criminal activity. So if you're released, you might still engage in new criminal activity. And then RST may engage in a violent criminal activity. So these three risk factors are something that judges are supposed to consider. 
So PSA is an algorithm, algorithmic recommendation to judges. Okay, so judges basically receive that number, um, which tells you how risky somebody is according to these three criteria. Okay. So it classifies arrestees according to FTA, NC, and BCA risks. It's derived from the application of some machine learning algorithm to a past data set. Okay. And what I want to emphasize, it's different from COMPASS score. So it's different from the score that became really controversial. It's the same idea, but it's a different type of calculation. So what we did is we conducted a field experiment. So this is an actual experiment in the real world uh, evaluating this PSA. It was done in a Dane County in Wisconsin, one of the states in the United States. In this case, PSA is a weighted indices of 10 factors. Uh, there are two separate ordinal six point score risk scores for FDA and NCA. FDA is a failure to appear in the court, and the NCA is a new criminal activity. One binary risk score for new violent criminal activity, NBCA. The only demographic, demographic factor is used is age. Okay, so there's no gender or race is used. Uh, there are nine factors drawn from criminal history such as prior convictions and FDA. So it's based mostly based on the criminal history um, and, the, and the age. Judges may have other information about an RST. Um, so there are, I'm listing a few. They may know something about it, uh, about, something about these RSTs beyond this um, uh, number that they have. So field experiment, uh, was conducted in the following way. So the clerk assigns case numbers sequentially as the cases enter the system. So if somebody gets arrested, they enter the system. And PSA is calculated for each case using the computer system. And if the first digit of case number is even, PSA is given to the judge. And if it's odd, PSA is not given to the judge. Okay. And then uh, we did this over 2017 to 2019. And the data I'm going to present you is a two-year follow-up uh, for the half, half, half of the sample. So here the treatment is whether to give PSA or not. So half the time, the judge see the score. And the other half of the time, judge don't see the score. And then we want to know how that influences judge's decision and arrestee's behavior. Okay. That way we know how the algorithmic recommendations affect the human decision. So here is some um, basic data. Um, what I want to show you is the first, there's a no PSA. So this is a control group where no PSA is given. Here is the treatment group where the PSA is shown to the judge. Okay. There are three uh, possible outcomes, signature bond, is the uh, case where the arrestee can just sign a piece of paper and then be released. And two other outcomes, a cash bond, small amount of cash and a large amount of cash, um, above or below $1,000, okay? And we have some information about the race, white versus non-white, and then gender, male versus female. And as you can see, the female um, sample is very small. 21% uh, total, mostly male, um, sample is mostly male. Okay. You can also see that Byron crime committed the very small number, 6% or 109 cases. There's total of about 1,900 cases. Okay. And most of the decisions are signature bond. That, that's the most lenient decision, uh, about 37 case, uh, percent of cases. Uh, so that's basic, uh, basic data. Uh, here is the, uh, the uh, distribution of PSA. As I said, there are three scores, uh, two ordinal scores, six point scale ordinal score for FDA and NCA separately, and then binary score for NVCA. Okay? 
And um, in each of this, uh, the width represents the uh, sample size. And we see that uh, I highlighted uh, three different decisions. So judge decision, there's three decisions. Uh, harshest decision is the darker uh, black, okay? Uh, more than thousand dollars of cash bond. And then lightest decision, the most uh, lenient decision is signature bond, which is great. So you can see there's a little bit of upward curve, which means that there's a correlation uh, between the score and then judge decision. Okay, so the um, the cases where the uh, algorithm said it's very risky, the judges tend to give uh, harshest, more harsh decisions uh, than the cases where the uh, algorithm said it's uh, low risk. Okay. And you can also see the NBCA there as well. So this is data based on the treatment group where the judge actually see the score. The bottom is the control group data. And you can also see the similar pattern. Um, so it, this means that even when the judge don't see the score, uh, judge's decision is correlated with the, the actual underlying score, even when they don't see the score. Okay. Um, we can look at the difference between uh, white and non-white. So this is non-white males. Uh, we're going to focus on for the racial analysis, just the male, because female sample is too small. Um, so you can compare with the white, uh, which is the bottom and the non-white. And then you can see that there's a quite a difference. Uh, non-white tend to receive the higher risk scores. So there's the width of this bar is much wider for the non-white. Um, decision might be a little bit also different. Um, for example, the, uh, if you are um, seen as a highest risk for the failure to appear, the um, most decisions tend to be very harsh decision for non-white compared to the white. Okay. So there's some interesting racial differences as well. Now we can do a simple intention to treat analysis of PSA provision. So this is what is the impact, what is the effect of showing PSA to the judges? How does that influence judge decision? Okay. So here is the effects. Uh, I'm looking, showing you overall the, uh, effect and then subgroup effects. Okay. So gray is the signature bond, um, uh, the triangle is the small cash bond, and then the square is the large cash bond. So as you can see, that all the effects tend to be <coughs> somewhat concentrated at zero, which uh, suggests that the showing the PSA doesn't seem to affect the judge's decision much. Um, there's some maybe effect on the female. Um, they seem to the P, give it, showing the algorithm, uh, algorithmic recommendation seems to increase um, the signature bond decision. So it makes the decision more lenient, um, but that's still suggestive. The confidence interval overlaps uh, with zero. So there is a statistically insignificant, insignificant effect on judge's decisions, uh, showing PSA doesn't seem to change. Now, if you look at um, estimated effects on the outcome, so this is the effect, uh, effect of showing the PSA to judges on the RST's um, behavior. So the FTA, NCA, and VCA, there's three, three different behaviors. The one thing we noticed that for the female, there is more violent um, commi uh, com crime that's committed by the female. So somehow, the showing the PSA score to the judges increases uh, the violent crime for the female through the judge's decision. So now we can look a uh, bit more detail how that works. Okay, so th this suggests uh, we need to explore um, some causal heterogeneity based on uh, uh, different risk levels. Okay. So to figure out a little bit more, um, we can do some causal inference. Um, so here is some uh, simple causal model where judge decision is a D, PSA is a score. Score is a function of the previous data, um, some 
uh, machine learning going on here and the RST characteristics. So these two things become the score and the score affects the decision. Decision is also affected by the RST's characteristics and the judge's past experiences. And the decision then affects the behavior of RST. And the RST's behavior is also obviously affected by their own characteristics. Okay. So we can think about the potential outcomes, um, which is related to the fundamental problem of causal inference. So imagine there's a judge decision without PSA. So this is the decision judge would make if they don't see the PSA. You can also think about judge decision with PSA. So what, what the judge would decide uh, if they're showing um, PSA, okay? And then there's RST's behavior if, uh, if detained versus RST's behavior if released. So the trick is that we only get to see one of these two outcomes, right? So judges either um, receive PSA or not, and we get to see if the judge received PSA, we get to see this outcome, okay? this decision. But if the judges doesn't have PSA, then we only get to see this decision. We don't. We never get to see both decisions. Okay. So this is the fundamental problem of causal inference. Same things for RST. RST behavior we only get to see if the RST is released. Um, we only get to see this outcome, but we don't know what RST would have done if they are detained. Um, so what we can do is we can look at the causal effects for different uh, different risk levels. So for example, so we can look at we can compare the decision with PSA and without PSA among the cases where someone will commit a new crime only when they are released, and that person wouldn't commit a crime if they are not released. So this is among the people who only commit a new crime if they're released, what's the decision uh, difference? What's the effect of PSA? Okay. So if the PSA is helping, then these preventable cases, the PSA should nudge uh, judge to detain the RST. There are safe cases where the RST would never commit a crime, whether or not de detained or not, it doesn't matter. These are safe cases. Then the judges should not detain the RST. So the PSA should uh, nudge judges to not to detain um, the RST. Yeah. And then the risky case is a case where the um, RST will commit a crime no matter what. Um, okay, so, so in this way you can estimate the effect of PSA on judge decision for different type of cases. So risky cases, safe cases, and the preventable cases. And then the hope is that the PSA will help distinguish those three cases. Um, we can talk about fairness, but maybe I'm running out of time. Is that right, uh, Professor Ho? Uh, we, I think we started, we still have uh, maybe a few more minutes, so so we can okay. have some Q&A, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah please, so, please proceed, uh, yeah, please proceed. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, maybe, let me skip the fairness, and if there's any interest, I can come back to that. And I'll show uh -huh. you the results, okay? <clears throat> okay, so first we can estimate the proportion of different types of cases for each of the outcomes. So what I show here is that um, the most cases are safe in that in, even if you release somebody, they will not fail to appear. So they will come back to the court and then they will hear the decision by the judge. Okay. And there's very small proportion of the cases that are preventable. That is, if you uh, impose a large amount of bail, they will be detained, and then they, you know, if if they get released, uh, they may not come back to to the court. So that kind of case is very small, um, small proportion. 
Okay. Um, if you look at the new criminal activity, the same thing. You can see that highest proportion is the safe cases. So most cases you can release them and they will not commit a new crime. Okay. There are some cases, small number of cases, where if they are released, they may commit a new crime. But that's a very small proportion. And the same thing about NDCA, this is a violent crime. So in that case, mm -hmm. it's even higher. So most people will never commit violent crime if they're released. And these uh, very small, tiny proportion are the ones that um, who commit a uh, new crime if they're released. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's across the board. There is no racial differences or there's no gender differences there. Not much. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now we can look at uh, the effect of PSA on each of different risk levels. Um, uh, the judge decision for each each different risk levels. Okay. So this is uh, with respect to the failure to appear. You see that overall there's almost no effect. So um, basically that showing the algorithmic recommendation has no effect on judge decision regardless of the risk level. Now, among the female, there's some evidence that PSA makes judge more lenient. So judge become more lenient for the female. But that happens across different risk levels. So it doesn't matter what the risk levels are. Judges seems to give more lenient decisions. If you look at the next uh, outcome, criminal activity, uh, the same thing. It seems that um, judges make more, become more lenient for the female cases uh, across the risk level. So there is no discrimination. The last, lastly, the firing crime, you see this here again. But in this case, if you look at the male sample, there's some slope here uh, for the preventable cases. In the preventable cases, what this means is that they are giving harsher decision in the preventable cases. And then, um, so that, what that means is that uh, PSA is actually helping because the preventable cases are the cases where judges perhaps should impose a harsher uh, condition so that they won't commit a new crime. Uh, so there's some evidence that the PSA is helping judges um, differentiate uh, these different risk levels um, for especially not new violent criminal activity. Um, but for the female, basically across the risk levels, they are becoming more lenient. Um, and I'll skip the fairness. Um, so that's sort of that's basically the um, the conclusion is that um, even though overall the PSA appears to have very little effect, uh, in some cases it it seems that um, there's some effects. So in the case of female. Actually, PSA is just um, uh, making the judges more lenient, giving the algorithmic number is giving, making the judges more lenient for the female cases. For the male cases, there seems to be, PSA seems to be helping the preventable cases from safe cases. And there is no difference between the white and uh, non-white. So the racial difference, there is no racial difference, evidence for the racial difference uh, in terms of the impact of the PSA on judges. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we offer a set of statistical methods for experimentally evaluating algorithm assisted human decision making. We conducted the field experiment for assisting the pretrial public safety assessment. Um, most existing research uses observational data or hypothetical survey experiment. This is the, uh, I think, the, one of the first studies. Um, that does the experiment. Uh, we have more ongoing experiments uh, in this and um, several other counties. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting questions about um, thinking about law of incarceration, how that affects um, uh, people who are arrested. Um, what is the optimal way to construct these uh, scores? And then how these scores impact judges and arrestees uh, over time. Uh, before I end, I want to emphasize again the importance of quantitative social science. Um, so data analysis matters as the examples that I showed you today, one in the illustrated reading, uh, the other in the 
uh, judicial decision making, making, uh, data analysis matters. Uh, it affects our lives and the livelihood. Um, we need to uh, understand how the data is used to uh, impact our policies and uh, our lives. Uh, statistics are not just for the natural sciences and business. Um, the social scientists, policy makers, and the journalists also have to analyze the data. And I hope that uh, I gave you some sense of how that can be done uh, in the different policy areas. Uh, so the quantitative social science is really a combination of both the social science and the statistics uh, or machine learning. So that you need to combine those two areas. Uh, both are important. Um, and we need to use the data to uh, analyze to solve the uh, problems in, in, in today's society. Uh, so that's all I have today. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Imai. This is uh, wonderful. We are basically uh, having your two presentations in one. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for, for giving two. Uh, um, I think this is the really the uh, 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 state of the art uh, latest uh, methods that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in all the methods. I, I have all, uh, all uh, um, uh, I've been to your um, presentations in uh, um, Asia Pomath and uh, um, you are just uh, uh, your arsenal. Just uh, you have a toolbox that I think you have like a all kinds of weapons, all kinds of uh, tools that you have, and you also develop your own app too, your own packages too. Now, um, how about this? I, I think we will just uh, do the Q and proceed with the Q and A section this way, and I am encouraging uh, the students from the United States or. Uh, to to post questions and you can do in the uh, uh, conversation box and uh, the Taiwan students if they like to ask questions please uh, uh, send questions to uh, Dr. Pan so he will uh, read out the questions and then uh, um, then uh, Dr. E Mai can uh, can respond to the questions and we will try to make it more interactive now uh, maybe I can get started and I I'm interested in both papers. Let me get started with us. Um, um, the, I asked one question on the uh, case about uh, gerrymandering. Now, allow me to ask another question about this uh, applications uh, used in the um, uh, um, uh, justices, how they use the information. I'm interested in information. For example, you, your suggestion is uh, how we can uh, provide a more informed uh, um, decision guidelines for this uh, uh, course uh, on gerrymandering mandering or on this uh, cases uh, based on a com compass, call, compass score. So you introduced the method uh, for uh, causal inference. So I saw one method that was very similar to like a mediation. So can you do some simple comparison uh, to mediation method or maybe uh, just a moderation? versus the causal inference method you just introduced? Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so it's it's very similar to mediation in the sense that mm -hmm. so we have, um, you know, the uh, the score, the PSA score, and PSA mm -hmm. score affects mm -hmm. the RST's behavior through the judge's mm -hmm. decision. So in that sense, uh -huh. the judge's decision is a mediator, and uh -huh. um, you know, through that decision, the algorithm affects how the RSTs behave. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. in that sense, um, you can think of the, you know, uh, judge's decision as a mechanism, a mediator, and uh, these algorithmic, um, you know, the scores are affecting uh, people's behavior in mm -hmm. that way. I mean, you can see, uh, mm -hmm. like if you think about online shopping, the Amazon, if you're on the Amazon website, Amazon will give some suggestions, mm -hmm. and that suggestion affects your decision, and then uh, decision mm -hmm. product to buy, and then that decision will affect. Mm -hmm. Right. So, in that sense, the uh, the decision is a mediator. Human decision is a mediator. Algorithm is a treatment, mm -hmm. and then the treatment is affecting your behavior, 
uh, your life mm. uh, your lives uh, through your decision. <laughs> and we want to understand yeah. that, you know, how that uh, how that works. How that, how that Actually, that uh, we maybe the, because of time limit, we have a couple of slides that is really interesting in uh, to illustrate the the uh, statistical fairness uh, um, method. But I think I want I don't want to take too much time, and maybe I can ask uh, the Taiwan side. Uh, anyone uh, from the Taiwan side would like to, or maybe the Hong Kong. Uh, uh, we have Polit Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, faculty and students here, uh, please, and uh, uh, maybe we can do that. Uh, uh, take take in terms in asking questions. Uh, uh, Professor Pan, do you have any questions on your side? Maybe I can read out one question before uh, Dr. Pan do that. Uh, one question from Academia Sinica. I think you you've been there, and uh, thanks for a great presentation. I have a question on the second study. Does the score Judges see aside equal ways to suspect demographic traits, or it has different ways to them. Do judges know how the scores were estimated? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the question was yeah. whether the judge actually know how the scores are calculated. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that uh, information is online. It's available. So there's mm. a website you can judges and or you can go. And then figure out like which factors are weighted more, um, but mm -hmm. but I don't think that judges will actually go to that uh, website. I mean, figure that out. <laughs> but, yeah, but they they actually know, right? Uh, it's open, you know, public information. Um, even yeah, that's that. So that's that's you know, I think that's important. Um, if you use the algorithm in the uh, public policy, um, it needs to be transparent. Uh, if if the if we don't know what factors are going in to the algorithm, mm -hmm. how they are being weighted, um, uh -huh. then there's, um, there's going to be a room for manipulation, uh, and you know I think uh, there's a lot of racial biases and other type of bias can creep in. So we need to make sure that the our algorithm itself is very transparent, uh, so that everybody knows uh, what's going in, how it's calculated. Um, so I think that's really, actually, really important, uh, important part um, of the, you know, use of algorithm in this kind of um, decision making, important decision making. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, I saw another hand. Uh, uh, there's one more student from UTD, as uh, my student Carrie. Um, do you think there is a long term end? insight for gerrymandering in the United States? If so, how could that be achieved? Thanks so much for your time. And uh, she's oh, very kind. Yeah. And uh, Carrie Reinhardt, well, and, uh, please. You know, <laughs> for a uh, very difficult question, like uh, whether <laughs> gerrymandering or whatever. And uh, yeah, so there is definitely a movement uh, for many states to introduce uh, independent commission. So you know, this uh, not letting the politicians decide how the district boundaries should be drawn, let the experts and non-partisan body to decide. Um, in Japan, that's how it's determined, um, the mm -hmm. a group of experts, and the politicians are not supposed to be influencing them. Um, and I'm, I'm curious how the Taiwan decides. I think my guess is that America is very unique in that <laughs> ready in politicians mm -hmm. uh, draw the line. So as long as that happens, if that's allowed, I think there is going to be a tendency for gerrymandering. But if we can use the data to detect uh, those gerrymandering, then we can prevent that. So it's either, I think, you know, most important thing is to use the uh, institutional uh, mechanism to prevent the gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. But if that happens, maybe we can use the data to uh, detect the gerrymandering and then let the court uh -huh. uh, decide this is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, it's a political question. It's a how you how you achieve um, mm -hmm. the end of uh, gerrymandering is a you know political uh, political question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all know the politics don't uh, work in the way many of us want. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I think uh, your, your your approach is suggest that you suggest uh, uh, with data or uh, statistical methods, uh, the judges can make more more generally informed uh, yes. decisions. That's yeah, right. more more data, more information, and more uh, 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 smarter algorithm. The decisions will be more uh, uh, convincing in uh, in a way that is not just arbitrary. Right. So. Gerrymandering and also this case about uh, 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 racial profiling, and uh, that will get better and better with uh, better informed decisions. Maybe I can uh, uh, bring uh, bring the uh, uh, the mic to uh, to Taipei, Tai 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 Chong Sai. I'm sorry, Taiwan Sai. And uh, yeah. Professor Pan, do you have any students or any any yeah. faculty members who would like to pose a question, please? Yeah, I think so. Here is a question right here. <laughs> okay, well, there was there was a question, but it's being you know, answered. So, uh, okay, okay. Here's another question. I would like to direct my question at the professor the director. When you are evaluating the data itself, how do you know if the data itself is trustworthy? And if the, there's a problem with the data, then will that lead to a false result? In Taiwan, we will gather all the surveys on regard a uh, question. As for racial um, discrimination, also I would like to talk about the education profile and also the uh, religion profiles because you know we want to know if the judge is really fair, whether or not the judge actually honors. Uh, fairness and uh, human rights. And also, because uh, are, are you looking at the data you know, from the perspective of a Japanese or the United States? Or, for example, uh, you worked in uh, Afghanistan. Did you also uh, see the data you know, from the uh, Afghan perspective or Taliban perspective? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. For the excellent question, I mean, this is a very important question. Yes, I, I agree with you totally that uh, accuracy of data is is essential, right? So we always say garbage in, garbage out. So if the data is garbage, however good the methods are, the uh, results will be garbage. So the accuracy of the data is in, uh, in, in very, very important. Uh, in the United States, related to the redistricting, uh, the 2020 census was terminated already, despite the pandemic. So the Census Bureau had a hard time collecting the data, contacting the people because of the pandemic. And so they requested um, the longer time period to collect uh, uh, more data, more accurate data. However, the administration terminated that process already so that I would expect that mm -hmm. the, this this year's census would be not as accurate as it could have been. And that's going to impact all the processes that's going to follow because how much the federal government gives money to the local community is based on the census figure. Redistricting is based on the th census figure because we need to know how many people live where. Okay. So, and then the school districts, that's also based on the census data. How many kids live in a particular school district? Uh, how much money each school need? All of that um, decisions, the policy decisions, will be based on the data. And then the, if the data is accurate, you know, inaccurate, then uh, that's going to bias the results in a certain way. And as a result, that's going to bias the policy as well. The same thing can be said about the uh, second example I, I discussed. All these uh, mm -hmm. algorithms that's being used could be biased against uh, certain racial groups, maybe because the data that's collected are not very accurate for certain type of groups. So it is also important to evaluate the accuracy of the data, which is much harder than, than the uh, accuracy uh, of decision and score itself, um, but we need to pay attention to how the data are corrected, how the data are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, validated, 
and that's uh, that's critical. And then the last question about um, the perspectives of the data analysts, um, yeah, that's also an important, um, very important question. I think this is why that I encourage uh, the the data scientists, the people like myself, to analyze the data, to work with the uh, substantive researchers who know the area and the topic and the people who are involved, uh, stakeholders, uh, really well. So in the Afghanistan uh, study I mentioned, I worked with this NGO who partnered with local um, local groups. Uh, to run this uh, job training program. Uh, my co collaborator was the Afghan specialist who speaks the language and studies Afghanistan for a long, long time. My second study, uh, the judicial decision-making study, I work with the law school professor who's been involved in this type of um, study um, uh, of, of you know, racial uh, bias and uh, fairness. In, uh, in the judicial uh, settings. So I, I think, um, you know, data cannot solve ev everything. So that's why I think I want to emphasize that social science and statistics both together, not just the statistics and not just the social sciences. I think we need to understand the society, we need to have a better perspective. And then together with the data analysis power, uh, we can begin to solve the problem. So yeah, thank you for Pointing that that mm -hmm. out, I don't want to make it sound like you know. If you if you have data, you can do everything. I think it's it's very very important to bring these um, substantive knowledge and perspectives into the data analysis. So so the type of this data analysis decision you're making is is um, you know it's well thought and um, and appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. And uh, one more question, uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, this is Professor G. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Ima, I'm really happy to hear your lecture. So I'm focusing my question on the second presentation because uh, when the judge makes a decision, oftentimes, you know, they have independent uh, judging, and that's constitutional. So in the United States, the Constitution also says that judges have to be independent. So it has always been like when we use data and AI, big data and AI, oftentimes we face a certain difficulty. For example, when we have data presented to a judge, whether or not the judge should really take the data into account, whether or not to really receive the help from AI and then to and then make a judgment. Because oftentimes judges, they have other considerations. For example, they have to consider all the facts. Some, some of the facts may not be present in the data. So if you ask the judge to just rely on AI and data, then the independence of judges may be compromised. Or on the other hand, if the judge disregards AI, then in that end, in that extreme, AI loses its purpose. You know, the purpose of helping judges, because you know, in Taiwan's judiciary, judiciary, you know, we have been talking about you know different levels of of sentences and a lot of data we have been working on. This is why I'm so interested in this because you mentioned that in the United States, for example, in Pennsylvania, they have you have this. Um, uh, research. So, how do you really uh, try to compromise, make it like find a middle ground in the between the two extremes? Yeah. So that's uh, uh, excellent question. Um, I don't have a good answer. I think the society is struggling with it. So, I think the reason why these um, you know counties I've been working with wanting to do this type of evaluation. Is precisely because of the question that you're raising, right? So this type of score 
has been used actually in a fairly long time, like maybe 20 years or even 30 years in the U.S. Uh, criminal justice system. So judges have been receiving some of these type of scores um, for a long, long time, and then making a decision. They don't have to take that into consideration. That's their uh, choice. However, they've been presented with this type of scores. And the, um, the article that I, um, ProPublica article that journalists basically did analysis and then felt that, um, find some evidence that these scores are actually racially biased. But I think it's exactly right that what matters is not necessarily that whether the score is biased or not. Um, that also is obviously important. But then the question is how that bias of the AI interacts with the bias of the humans. And mm -hmm. that's a really difficult question because every human being is different. So they, and then every case might be different so that humans have a decision to uh, figure out whether to use this particular score or not in every different case. And then we need to understand that how they basically these type of scores are affecting the human decision. And then like you said, mm -hmm. like, what is the happy medium? How is it, is it possible to take advantage of the sum of the accuracy perhaps and the transparency of the algorithm while preserving the human autonomy or human decision, right? So these are um, extremely important questions. And I think the society and the academia is just the beginning to struggle with this question. So we're trying to figure out what, what do we mean? What do we mean by fair decision? How does the AI mm -hmm. help us make a better or more fair decision? And you know, the, this study is um, really uh, one of the first studies of experimentally evaluating how this AI affects the human decision by randomly, you know, giving half of the case the judge sees the score, and the other half of the case judge doesn't see the score, and that allows us mm -hmm. to do the comparison how the judges make a decision, um, you know, uh, in, in, with when the uh, the score is presented. And what we are finding is that it seems that human mm -hmm. bias is pretty persistent. So the AI affects to some extent, but, but it seems the human uh, bias is still there and it's, it's not um, completely either eliminated or even magnified by AI. So now that this type of fun, you know, finding will depend on the context and the situation. So we cannot generalize this small study to any other context, but we need to start, you know, paying more attention, and then um, we have to study like how these AI is affecting our decision making mm -hmm. and our lives. Um, yeah, so there's a huge sort of uh, big question that you asked, and uh, you know, many many studies are needed in different areas uh, to answer that uh, very important question. Mm -hmm. All right, and now now we are. Uh, my my uh, my time here is reading uh, nine thirty seven, which is ten thirty seven p.m. in in Cambridge already. Now I have one follow up question. Maybe uh, maybe uh, okay. Dr. Pan, do you have more questions? I'm quite awake, so if you want to ask more questions. Okay. Yeah, here are a couple oh. more questions here. Okay. Okay. 呃，伊曼教授你好，我想请问，既然大数据 ，Well, since big data and machine learning has have brought about a revolution, but、uh, for example, we have you know traditional tools for、uh, statistics. So, why why do you think the value of the traditional tools for statistics、uh, is still? Because we already have new tools. What about old old ones? Hello. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, so the question is traditional statistics. By traditional statistics, what do you mean? Do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Wait, can, can I just be an interactive? I was wondering what, what, yeah. The, yeah, what he meant by traditional statistics. Yeah. Uh, in 
还没有强调因果推论以前 ，before inference， most、uh, social sciences were、uh, sampling， and then we have regression analysis， and we have hypothesis。So now we can skip sampling， and then we can just face the population itself。So take the U.S. election for example， there is some polling error， and also they have different methodologies， and which Yielded different results. So, do we still need statistics, or can we just implement like other new ways to just look at the population itself without, you know, being indirect with with the measurements? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a very good question. Yeah. So, hmm.、Um, you know. So, it's, it's this polling issues.、Uh, obviously, like the election forecasting was.、Uh, Even worse than the 2016,、um, you know, in the、uh, public opinion polls in the United States, the、uh, when they do the phone survey, the、uh, response rate is you know less than 10 percent now. So this idea of random sampling is no longer applicable.、Um, so it, you know, it may appear that statistics is somewhat.、Um, Irrelevant traditional statistics, but I I still think that it's important to study statistics. So a lot of new techniques, the machine learning techniques that's coming, is is a very nice way of extracting the information from very very noisy data. At the same、mm-hmm. time,、um, you know, as one of the questions, the earlier questions pointed out, if the data are garbage,、um, then however cool the methods are. The results are、uh, not very good either. So, it is still important to think about the sampling, you know, data correction mechanism, randomization of the treatment assignment. These type of traditional statistics tools, I, I still think, is important. And the other thing that we、uh, also important is the, we need to be able to interpret、um, the results in order to understand、uh, the results from the statistical model. So. You know, someone asked about do judges know how the scores are calculated? I do think it's really important that the score are easy to understand. And in fact, that this particular score that I evaluated in the second project is very simple. It's a weighted average of nine factors. Each factor、mm-hmm. has different weights. Okay, and that's a lot more easier for judges to understand than say some output from the deep neural network, right? Then you have no idea how the,、uh, the score is computed, and if the score is some, you know, doing some wrong things, we have no、mm-hmm. idea how to fix it either, right? Because we can't really interpret、um, how the model is constructed. So, on one hand,、um, for certain purposes, these new tools, machine learning tools, are very effective and important. But if we want to understand Uh, right, not just to predict. If we want to understand、um, the data and the results, and if we want to improve our、um, our society using the data, I do think it's important. As simple traditional methods、uh, are equally as important as、uh, fancy traditional、uh, fancy new methods. And then、um, you will see that you,、uh, in the in the in the recent.、Um, Development, people are trying to combine those two. So, with the traditional sort of statistical ideas, combined with newest machine learning algorithms. Yeah, so I think you know both will continue to be important.、Uh, so we have a lot to、uh, study and learn. And I always feel like myself, you know, I'm trying to learn as much as I can every day, so that I don't become obsolete and.、Uh, Uh, dinosaurs. So young, young students.、Um, my students、uh, continuing to teach me、uh, the new methods.、Mm-hmm. All right. Allow me to pose one question from my side here.、Uh, Wen Chin from Academia Sinica also have a follow up question. You might, if you do not mind.、Uh, the follow up question is: the human bias are observed at the aggregate level. Do you consider how the heterogeneity of judges interact with AI? 
Specifically, do different judges respond to scores differently? Yeah. yeah so excellent question. Um, unfortunately, this experiment, there's only one judge. Uh, so we don't <laughs> It's a uh, small, uh, small court uh, that we focused. Uh, we had a permission to do the experiment. So unfortunately, there's only one judge. And so we don't know how the heterogeneity of the judges affect. But I would expect, I mean, you're probably also thinking that different people will react. Um, AI mm -hmm. uh, scores differently. And so, mm -hmm. you know, again, this, uh, this presents a complicated um, situation where there's no like a single solution you can't just say you know give this score to this person right everybody is going to react differently to different scores and so i mean this heterogeneity i think makes the human society much more interesting you can make mm -hmm. the machine recommendation you know the same for everything that's possible that machine is just a function but the humans are all different so how they react to different Algorithm recommendation is is also different. So that makes it hard to come up with a single solution for everybody in every circumstances. Um, but that you know, so that makes it things challenging, but also makes it interesting. And this is why the social scientists have to right play a role because we try to understand how different people react to different things. Like look at the COVID, like same viruses. Different countries, massively different mm -hmm. reactions. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's that heterogeneity that's challenging. Um, you know how different mm -hmm. Taiwan. You guys are in the same classroom. Right? <laughs> I'm still teaching from home. Um, I mean, it's so different, um, but, but yeah. So exactly, I think this heterogeneity. So we we have several other uh, counties that we are doing the experiment right now. And so we'll have more different judges. So we'll begin to understand how different judges may react uh, these scores differently. Yeah, but, but thank you, the very good question. Great. Uh, Dr. Penn. Yeah, I hear a couple more questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think so, we still have 15 minutes, right, Dr. Imai? I would like to ask some questions about privacy. As you have mentioned, the registered voters list and in that list are indications which party you belong to and also which party you have voted to. And I am worried about digital surveillance because right now in Taiwan, we have this digital identification issues. And in your registered voters list, there is their name, address, and phone number, and also information about who you have voted for in this presidential election, then I'm worried about the digital privacy. Yeah, thank you for a very good question. Just to uh, make sure that I said it correctly, so you don't have, we don't have information about which candidate you voted for, but we have information about whether you turned out, whether you actually voted. We have no, you know, we, nobody knows which, which candidate you voted for. So that's a secret about it. Um, yeah, so it, this is very unusual for United States. So most countries don't have this information available, publicly available, right? Uh, so in the United States, I think there is a strong belief that government should not only own the data and that sort of there's a little bit of i think um perhaps the lack of trust in the government so if the government is is the only entity that has access to the data there could be bad things happen so if that's the case it's better to let everybody have that information um uh, now you might you know you might be okay with the government having the data but not other people see uh, where you are, where you live and all that. So it's, you know, I think different countries have different notion of privacy, um, but, but it is important, um, as you say, um, you know, the, in the big data era, um, we have let 
very little privacy. So one thing that um, a lot of people are working on now is that it turns out you can combine multiple data sets and then identify who you are and what you do, even though one data set alone may not um, identify mm -hmm. you. So even if your name is not disclosed in one data set, if you combine multiple data sets yeah. that have the mm -hmm. name, you can identify mm -hmm. who you are, right? So these mm -hmm. technologies have been developed, um, which may threaten the privacy um, of, of all the citizens. So there is, you know, I, I think there's a huge, um, so people working on a technological solution to protect the privacy, um, so that's going to be very important, but then also the government regulation will be also important, right? So, so again, here the social science will come in, not just the technological solution, but then how that technology will be used uh, in the government policies. And so I, I think there's a fascinating um, area of, you know, regulatory studies and Social science areas that um, that one could be studying, but but I, I I totally agree with your concern that you know someone coming from Japan, like I was shocked first time when I found out the registered voter list is available, but then I realized that one perspective is that or well, if the government is the only one that has it, they might do something that something horrible, so maybe it's mm -hmm. better for everybody to have it have that information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mm -hmm. interesting. You know, I'm not sure you, in Taiwan, that's the kind of perspective that people would uh, agree with. Um, in Japan, it tends to be opposite. Like the government tends to have lots of information, but they don't make that available, uh, which could also mm -hmm. be a problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a freedom of information and the privacy uh, can go against each other sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? One more over there? So do we have any extra questions online? No, we are. I think uh, we do not yeah. have any questions on the, okay. on the and conversation. Um, Here's yeah. a question from the floor. Thank you. Uh, I would like to direct my question at Imai. In your uh, core PSA research, what is your ultimate goal? Are you going to replace certain decision made by judge whether an arrestee is going to be released? The decisions about whether arrestee is going to be released on bond or signature is that your ultimate goal to replace that part of the decision made by judge with your AI with your PSA score yeah, thank you um, so my role as a social scientist is to evaluate how these scores affect the it's, mm -hmm. it's it's a politician's decision and, and, and ultimately people's decision, the society's decision as to whether to use AI at all or whether, you know, if you're gonna use AI, how the score should be calculated. All of that is society's decision. Um, as, a, as someone who studies social science, my role is to help them make that decision. So I can tell them this score you know, providing this score to the judge is making the judge decision, um, changing judge decision in this way or that way. Um, I'm not in the position to say, you know, change this decision or change that decision. I'm trying, like I think the role of the scientist is to provide the information to the policy makers so that they can make an informed decision. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that this county asked us, my, my collaborator and I, to evaluate this AI, the impact of AI, was that they were concerned that AI is influencing judges' decision in a certain way, a like racially biased way. So they wanted us to figure out whether that's actually the case. And now that we have some results um, reported to them, 
Now they can decide, uh, the, the politicians can decide whether to keep using this score or, you know, use different score or perhaps not use the score at all. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think, you know, we as a social scientist need to get involved and then provide more information. But scientists don't make a decision, right? Scientists provide uh, uh, information to help the decision makers, the politicians, uh, make the decision. So, so that's how the, these studies uh, work, is that we write a report and then the politicians will take that and then, you know, people in Wisconsin will decide what to do. <laughs> All right. Uh, Peter, do you have more questions on the, on the floor, from the floor? All right, that's about it. Yeah. And it's All right, great. And, uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yi Mai. And now this is a, uh, wow, this is a, the, uh, uh, I think it's overwhelming that uh, the students will want to keep you more longer. <laughs> but I think we will have to uh, call it a night and this is really, really uh, informative. I particularly uh, like your uh, remark about how social scientists can uh, use this data science big data to help it, uh, inform policy making uh, or help inform uh, uh, judicial decisions. So we know that down the, down the road there will be more AI big data used in uh, uh, decisions like in the court, decisions like in the government, but this really bad for uh, social scientists to, to get them more advice, more informed advice with the data with the, the with the uh, uh, ai big data yeah uh, i really appreciate your effort to help uh, educate uh, the next generation of social scientists to do more and i wish you all the success in your in the program and uh, you have a new program data science right yeah yeah great i think okay. i will uh, just and, wrap up. Uh, yes. um, okay. allow me and uh, give me this an opportunity and me and the audience to give uh, Dr. Imai a way round of applause, okay? Yeah, so you can hear it. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, it's always difficult to do this over internet, but um, I appreciate uh, listening to me yeah. and I hope soon I can see you guys in, in person when this uh, pandemic is over. Well, it's over over there, but not here. So hopefully soon. Okay, I consider that a deal, all right? And then <laughs> that. <laughs> I hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hall, Dr. Hall, and thank you, Dr. Imai. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. It. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Uh, thank you, thank you. Have a good night, Imai. Have a good night. Good night. Have a good night, bye. Bye. bye.